What's up, everybody? Welcome to Lesson 28. It's on Acts chapter 28. Uh, we're going to be studying the ESV version today. My name is Sean Carlson. I'm blessed to be on the Time to Revive team, and I'm happy to be here today walking through the last book of the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, it's, been a, it's a fun book. It's a good read. It should be on the bestsellers list. Oh, I guess it is. Uh, <laughs> it's the Bible. You know it's on the bestsellers list, and they just stop publishing it because it, uh, it's always there. Anyway, uh, so the book of Acts, man, we've talked through a lot of stuff in the book of Acts. Remember when the Holy Spirit came in the beginning of the book and then uh, you know, the, the fire and the tongue and then uh, Pentecost and the church grew and then you get characters like Stephen and Philip and uh, you know, talking to the eunuch and then uh, we even get to like Barnabas and learning about Barnabas and Barnabas and Paul and then they split and Barnabas and Mark and uh, you know, we, don't, we won't see Mark again for a little while. Uh, and, then, and then we've got these journeys, these missionary journeys that Paul takes, the first, the second, the third journey. There's just a lot of stuff that we've learned through the book of Acts. And it seems like the last half of the book of Acts is really about Paul and we're really setting up the, the letters and the epistles that he writes. And it's fun to watch the writer, which is Luke, talk through some of these things and then parallel them with uh, the book, or the other book that he wrote, which is the Gospel of Luke, and then also match it up against some of the epistles, the letters that Paul has written. And so the book of Acts, just uh, it, it was written over a period of time, but this last chapter that we're going to be reading was written around AD 61 and 62. And that's, that'll come into play as, just a, as a frame of reference for when we talk about some stuff later on. Uh, but you remember yesterday in Acts chapter 27, we were talking about the journey. Paul is trying to get to Rome. Today, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. He finally gets there. But we, we, he, we talk about this journey and just the challenges that they had, the wind that was against them, and then the shipwreck and uh, people floating on the boards and uh, just all of that stuff. That's kind of where we left off. And so when we jump into Acts chapter 28, verse 1, just keep that in mind. And so let's just, let's just start here. So verse 1 says, After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And so we got a map here and just a point of reference. Remember, we started all the way over here. And so finally they made it to the island of Malta. It's just south of Sicily, just off Italy. And so it, when I look at this map, it kind of looks like a place that I would like to vacation. Have you guys ever, ever been to Malta? Have you ever been to Italy? No. No, no. I, have you? I have not. It's on my bucket list of places to go someday. Uh, but it just, it seems like a good place to, to be shipwrecked and uh, end up. Uh, and so even in Malta, when you go there today, there's a bay called St. Paul's Bay. And so obviously like St. Paul had an impact on the island and we're going to read about that. So let's go into verse two. It says, the native people showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. So remember, they were shipwrecked. They had to swim in the shore. They were wet. And so the, the natives built them a fire. And one of the things that I, I, I think of when I read this verse is when we think about missions in the context of going into people groups or into villages and things like that, we often don't hear stories that pro portray natives as being this hospitable. Usually missionaries talk about having to uh, navigate uh, being killed or, or navigate just having to spend time building a relationship. But right here we just see the native people showed us unusual kindness. And I, I think in part it's because Paul walked and he had favor. He walked in his authority. The Lord gave him favor. He knew where he wanted to go. The native people, they were not Greek and so they were unique to the island at the time. And so if we go to verse 3, uh, so uh, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came up because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So this is really interesting. Remember, the natives built him a fire, right? But Paul is going and gathering sticks to put on the fire. I just think that that's an that's a, that's a, a image of servanthood, that Paul is being a servant in this this short little verse, we get a little glimpse of that. You know, around here, Kyle always drills into us, you know, we're, we're, we're here to serve, we're here to serve, we're here to serve. And so let's just, you know, Matthew 20, 28, let's just go there. Matthew 28, 20, 28 says, Even as a son of man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as, life as a ransom for many. So Paul, uh, he just automatically has this servant attitude, servant heart, even when he's going into the island. And so we can resume. Let's go uh, to chapter, I'm sorry, uh, verse 4 here. Remember, Paul, Paul got bit by the, the viper, and it says in verse 4, When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Wow, there's a lot here. So first of all, it, it, do you like snakes? No. 
No, I hate snakes. Rich, do you like snakes? No. No. But what they said here and what they were thinking is that no doubt this man is a murderer, though he's escaped from sea justice. You notice capital J. The native people, they believed in gods and Greek gods and goddesses. Not our God. They believed in gods and goddesses. Justice was one of those gods. And so they, what they sensed was uh, since Paul was getting bit by a snake, that uh, it must be, you know, uh, karma. It must be coming back to bite him, so to speak. And so uh, that's just their, their mindset, their framework. So let's go on to verse 5. He, Paul, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. If I got bit by a snake, I would be freaking out. You'd be hearing me scream like a little girl. Everybody in the neighborhood would know it. And I wouldn't just be shaking it off and just kind of like casually like suffering no harm. I would have harm regardless of if I had harm or not. Uh, <laughs> and so... Uh, and when I think about Paul and writing some of his other letters, uh, a couple of verses came to mind, you know, in this context. Let's go to Ephesians 6.11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You know, like this, the, the viper, the snake, is it's just an image of, of, of Satan oftentimes in Scripture. And so, you know, you can't help but wonder if Paul, when he was writing this, was thinking back to his time around the fire with the natives on the island and just kind of shaking off the viper that had bit him when he was feeding the fire. Let's go to Ephesians 4, verse 27, Kevin. And give no opportunity to the devil. Paul just shook this off like nothing happened. There was no harm that went to him. And I believe that, you know, when Paul walks in this authority, he's, he's got the armor of God on. He gets it. He's walking in this authority that just allows him to say, whatever, get out of here. Uh, in the name of Jesus, be gone, essentially. And so let's go uh, back and let's resume in verse 6. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. He got bit by a snake. They wanted, they wanted to see, it's like a NASCAR race. They wanted to see the crash. But, <laughs> but, when, but when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Remember, they believed in gods and goddesses and something was uh, different about Paul, they saw something different in them that they recognized that was beyond human. They were right. So let's go to verse 7. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. You know what we would call this person when we do ministry? What would we call this person? Person of peace. A person of peace. That's right. He was hospitable, and he entertained them hospitably for three days while they were there. Uh, let's go on to verse 8. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. Next verse, verse 9. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. You know, the thing is, is that Paul was just walking in obedience, praying for him, praying for his dad. And through the power, through the authority that he has, uh, God healed his father. And when that happens, when the glory of God shines through, people are drawn to that. People want, want to see that. People want to witness it. They want to be a part of it. And that's what happened here. And one question I have for you guys is, it says, uh, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. Who do you think did the curing? God. God, for sure. I, I guess what I don't know, what I wonder myself is, is was it just Paul who prayed for all of them? Or do you think that Paul, not being able to keep his mouth shut about Jesus, was sharing Jesus with them, that some of them came to know the Lord, and that in the process, some of them own people from the island were praying for their own fellow islanders? Well, I just, I just have to think about like the centurion, the other people that were on the boat. They're all part of this story because they all were saved from the boat and landed on this island. So what are they even thinking? It doesn't say, and we don't exactly know, uh, but just what if uh, once they converted, if Paul converted them, once they converted, they just went out and started praying for other people. I think that would be an awesome, awesome part of the story. Uh, and I think it's something that we should even just follow ourselves. Let's, uh, let's just keep that in mind uh, as we share the gospel with people. So let's go on to verse 10. They also honored us greatly. This is the, uh, the people of the island. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Again, it's a person of peace. It's somebody who's going to provide, give them provision for what they were going to do. I remember 
uh, w before I joined Time to Revive, I, was, I worked in Minneapolis at a bank and we were getting ready to ship a container of stuff down our project that we were working on in Nicaragua. And, and the main thing to go on the container was a big tractor for the farmers. Uh, and we had some smaller stuff, but the organization helping us send the container, uh, they wanted to bless the people. And so they just shoved every nook and cranny of this container with medical supplies and non-perishable food. And, and that's when, when I think of this verse here, I just think of that, them stuffing every single cranny of that boat with food uh, and whatever else they needed, whatever provisions they needed uh, to go about their journey because they were blessed so greatly by Paul and, and the people who were traveling with him. And so, uh, verse 11. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered on the island, the ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Look, I just want to make one comment on this. Uh, you, you know, the twin gods, re remember the people of the island, they, they worshipped other gods. And so these twin gods as a figurehead were uh, almost like statues on that ship. And I just, I think sometimes as, as Christians, we say, oh, you know what, there's evil over there, let's not go over there. Uh, but Paul just walked in authority and said, if this is the way that God is going to get me where I'm going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride on the ship. I'm going to ride on this ship. It's like, it's like you know, sometimes at, at, at Halloween, you don't want to knock on the scary person's door. Uh, but what if they're giving up full-size candy bars? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to walk through uh, and greet them so that you can get the full-size snicker bar. And so verse 12 just says, and, and putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And, and from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Putili. Good, verse 14. There we found brothers and invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. I read a couple different versions of this and, and every version ends with the period. And I feel like after this journey, if, if Luke is writing this and Luke is part of the we that's in this, the sentence should say, and so we came to Rome. Finally, we got to Rome, exclamation point. But it's not written like that. And so we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. So verse 15. And the brothers there, when they heard us, about us, uh, came as far as the form of Appius, three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And, the, uh, and when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. I think that just demonstrates Paul's favor. You know, Paul has this guard and he was just allowed to stay by himself. They trusted him enough. Uh, obviously, he demonstrated enough of uh, the authority that he walked in, that he wasn't going to do anything rash. Paul knew where he was going. And so let's go to verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Paul's just kind of, he's rehashing everything that we've talked about already, his defense. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. The hope of Israel. What is the hope of Israel? Messiah. Messiah. Jesus. Jesus is the hope of Israel. I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Jesus that I'm wearing this chain. And in verse 21, it says, And they say to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. Uh, but the desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere is spoken against. What he's saying here is, be, we, but, but we desire to hear from you about this sect, which is like about these Christians. A sect is a part of a religion. Uh, that's the de definition. It's a group separated. And so we want to know about this separated group that we're calling Christians in our day. They want to know more. They're curious. They, they have seen, they've heard. Why does Paul walk with all of this authority? They're curious. And because Paul lives out his faith so well, they want to know more about it. Are we doing that? Do I live out my faith so well that people ask me about it? It's a good question. Let's go to verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in, in greater numbers. From morning until evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. This is like when they met from morning until evening. This is like 
when I went on a date with my wife for the first time, we went out for a simple dinner and we ended up closing the place down. This is like meeting somebody for coffee in the morning and you end up having dinner with them. This is, like, this is the depth of the conversation that they're having. And Paul is doing it both from the Law of Moses, which is what we're doing here in Revive School. We are learning the Law of Moses. We're learning the prophets. We're finding the Messiah in all of it so that we can most effectively tell others about it. Paul did it. It's a great example for us. Let's do it too. And some were convinced by what he said, but you know what? <laughs> others disbelieve. Well, you win some, you lose some, right? Some were convinced, others disbelieved. We're going to get into some fun stuff now here with Paul, and this is just going to give like a great picture of his purpose and his calling. And it says in verse 25, And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. And this is the statement. Paul says, The Holy Spirit was right in saying that your fathers, through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. It's like, he's just saying, like, if, if they would just do that, I would heal them, but, but they're not. And so they're, they're, they've been dulled out. This is the rejection of the gospel truth by the Jewish people. This is what they're rejecting. Paul, in the book of Romans, talks about the Jewish people rejecting the Messiah and that it comes to the Gentiles. And it's interesting that Paul wrote that book uh, almost four years earlier than this. So Paul has known this. Paul has been walking in this truth in his own mind for about four years. And finally, he just has enough courage to say to the authorities, you know what, he's going to read from the prophet Isaiah and say, you know what, your eyes have been blinded. They can barely hear. Their eyes have been closed. This is, this is an act of boldness that I think that we don't recognize when we read the text all the time. Let's go to verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. Guess what? You know what? They'll listen. And then verse 29, we're going to talk about this verse, but verse 29 says, and, and when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. You know, verse 29, it's interesting. If you're reading it in your Bible, it might be in brackets. Uh, it is not in every translation of the Bible. Uh, the reason for that is, is there's a lot of uh, people who have some opinions. Uh, the King James Version, which was translated in 1611, uh, it was translated from the text, the original text that they had available at the time. Since that translation, uh, they have found some new texts which they, which they believe are older that don't have this verse in there. And so when you have versions that are based on the King James Version, they'll have this. Uh, if, if you are, uh, have a version of the Bible that... Um, you know, maybe it's based on a, on, a, on a different original translation. It might not. This is not, in my mind, a verse that like makes or break my salvation. And so I don't get freaked out about it. But just so you know, if it's in brackets, that's why it's there. And so verse 30, it says, He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul taught, with all boldness and without hindrance. We see that demonstrated over and over and over again. He talked to the guards. He talked to the, to the kings. He talked to the judges. He talked to everybody with boldness and without hindrance. He walked in the authority. Remember his journeys, like all of the stuff that he had to go through in his three missionary journeys, uh, the imprisonment, like all boldness and without hindrance. And I think that there's, I, I want to walk through, here's five things that I feel like uh, outline Paul's calling and, and his life and ministry. And I think that they apply to all of us. And when we think about doing this with all boldness and without hindrance, I think these things are going to help us. So we've got five points. There's number one, his conversion. And we've talked about his conversion before. It's Acts 9.4. Uh, it says this, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice. This is Paul saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul, at some point in time, Paul had this moment where he was converted. He, was, he, he went from somebody who's persecuting the church to living his life for the Lord. So Paul had a conversion. Second point is called. Paul was called. And these all apply to you and I. These all apply to us. And this is Acts 9, verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 6, But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. 
He, he had a conversion experience. He said yes to Jesus. Uh, but then Jesus tells him what to do. He, he, he is called, rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you're going to do. I'm calling you. I will tell you what to do. We are all called by the Lord to do something for his sake. We are all called to do his work. The third point is Paul was confirmed in his calling. And that's Acts 9, verses 10 to 16. And we've read these verses over and over again in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 9, verses, verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias! And Ananias said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, and carry my name before the Gentiles, that's key, and the kings and the children of Israel. Paul's call was confirmed. Ananias confirmed Paul's call for him. Paul heard from the Lord, and you know what? We all have people in our lives who will speak into them, uh, speak into our lives for us, and confirm our calling. It might be uh, so obvious that they say, man, in a dream I heard this, and I'm supposed to release it to you, but sometimes it might be subtle. Somebody might be saying, you know, you're really good at that. You're really good at loving other people. You're really good at administrative things. You're really good at uh, teaching others. If you have a call on your life, it's okay to ask God to confirm it. Sometimes I think we work in our, in, at our desks or, or do whatever in the, in the workforce and we say, God, is this where you want me in a factory? But God, uh, God will show you where he wants you to work. It might be in that factory. It might be somewhere else. Uh, but at the same time, you can ask him to confirm your calling and God will do it just like we saw here. So that's number three. So number four uh, is commission. Paul was commissioned. And uh, we see that in Acts 22, verse 21. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Paul was, Paul was commissioned. Ultimately, he was commissioned to reach the Gentiles. Yes, he was uh, commissioned to reach the Jews and the Israelites. But ultimately, his call was to the Gentiles. And so he was commissioned. You see go in the Bible? That's a commission. You need to go. And Paul heard go. And you know what he did? He went. Paul was commissioned. He had a conversion experience. He was called by God to do something. That call was confirmed by Ananias. And then God commissioned him and told him to go. That's point number four. Point number five is communicate. Communicate? What does that mean? Well, there's something about saying what your calling is out loud. There's something about telling other people, this is what I've been called to. This is what I feel like the Lord's sensing me. Uh, or this is what I feel like the Lord is telling me to do. And Galatians uh, 1, 15 through 16. And it says this, Galatians 1, 15. Uh, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Remember, he was called. He revealed the son. In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. What, what Paul is doing here is he's writing a letter and he's stating what his calling is. He's putting it out there. And, and in some ways, he's putting it out there. He might be uh, relying on uh, the, the, the Church of Galatia to keep him accountable. You might tell a friend or your spouse so that you're able to, uh, to remain accountable to your calling. You might tell somebody so that they can encourage you along the way and say, how are you doing on your calling? How are you doing on walking that out? That's one example. Let's go to Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll re read uh, verse 8 as well. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And eight. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. And then verse 8 says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable reaches, riches of Christ. Paul communicates over and over again what his calling is. Sometimes he might communicate what his calling is so others understand what he's doing. But I think sometimes he restates what his calling is just as a reminder for himself. That's right. I've been called to this. That's right. Jesus, you spoke to me and you said, 
this is what you want me to do. God, you confirmed for me through a friend of mine, through a family member, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then let's go to 1 Timothy uh, verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is, this is one of Paul's last letters. He's just so confirmed in his calling that he says, I'm telling the truth, I am not lying. I'm a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul communicated what his calling was to others. He didn't do it out of arrogance. He didn't do it out of pride. I think sometimes he did it out of accountability. And I think sometimes he did it as a reminder to himself what he has been called to in life. I think we all can track along these five points. I think we all have a conversion experience. If you haven't, I hope you do. Uh, we all have a conversion experience where we say, Jesus, you're going to be the Lord of my life. And then when he's the Lord of our life, we have to listen to what he's saying to us. He's going to call us. He's going to call you into something. He's going to call you into something big, I promise you. And when you get called, he will confirm it and you can ask him to confirm it. God, I need confirmation. I remember when I left the marketplace and I came to Time to Revive, I, this is no lie, I asked the Lord to confirm my calling to move from Minnesota to Texas by having a car with a Texas license plate get into an accident with me. My wife did not like that confirmation call that I was asking, but you know what? He confirmed it through three license plates. And so I asked the Lord to confirm my calling, and he did. He showed up. And then God's going to commission you. When you're ready, God's going to say, all right, you've answered the call. Now it's time to go. Where are you going to go? you got to ask him, but he'll show you. And then you know what? Once you've confirmed all of that in your life and you've got peace about it, I think you need to start communicating it to others. Tell your spouse, tell your friend, tell your parents. This is what I feel like I've been called to because they're going to surround you and they're going to speak into your life and they're going to encourage you and they're going to lift up that calling on your behalf. They'll come around with you. Maybe they have to finance it. Maybe they have to pray for you, but they will be there for you if you communicate it to them. And in part of you communicate it to them, you're reaffirming it to yourself. What I heard, I know was true. And so I pray that all of you know that you have a calling by God. God is calling you to something, just like he called Paul. We see it at the end of the book of Acts, but throughout the entire book, we see this word authority. When you're called, you get the authority to do what he's asking you to do. And I pray that you are able to figure that out and then you actually walk it out. And so, Father, I, I pray that every person who's listening, that they, they spend time with you. And God, I pray that you speak so clearly to them what the calling on their life is, is that they have no doubt. And then, God, I'm asking you to confirm it for them. And then, God, once you know that they know, commission them. Tell them where to go. Tell them when to go. And then, Lord, I just pray that they have the boldness to communicate it to others and remind themselves constantly to write it down and just go back to it all the time. God, you've called me and I'm going to go. God, I pray that they walk in authority. I pray you walk in authority as you hear this. And God, I pray that Jesus is just glorified beyond belief in all of it. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, right, thanks everyone. That's the book of Acts. We're thrilled. It was an exciting book. I hope that you are moved and you're changed by reading through the book of Acts. I am, and uh, I look forward to spending some time with you again in the future. Later.